Hello, everybody. This is Val Thomas with MarketersBlackBook.com, and we are here again today with uh, interviewing another expert. Uh, this one is um, unique in the fact that, well, we've never done an interview uh, with a gentleman like this in, in this field, but it is so tremendously important to your business as an Internet marketer, how to protect yourself, how to do things uh, in, a, in a very compliant way. Uh, today we have Mark J. Rosenberg. He is counsel with Tartar, Krinsky, and Drop it, uh, Drogan. Is that correct, Mark? Drogan. Drogan, and in New York City, and he is an intellectual property um, in, uh, attorney, and he practices an intellectual property practice. Um, they have over 20 years of experience assisting clients in acquiring, protecting, enforcing, and licensing their intellectual property rights. Now, Mr. Rosenberg is experienced in all areas of patent, trademark, copyright, trade dress, internet, privacy, and uh, advertising law. And in addition to being a litigator, he counsels clients in negotiating and structuring a wide variety of licenses, co-branding, distribution, procurement, and, services, and service agreements. Now, Mr. Rosenberg dedicates a significant part of his practice to e-commerce and internet marketing law, including can spam and Communication Decency Act compliance, uh, advertising, affiliate, and video marketing, search engine optimization, sweepstakes, and other games of chance, website development, affiliate, hosting agreements, privacy policies, and website terms of use. Mark, I'm really, really excited to have you here uh, to do this call, to do this interview with us so that we can share uh, a, really, uh, a really necessary uh, base of knowledge that a lot of internet marketers don't seek first, it seems. And I know that I'm uh, I'm really no, not uh, not innocent in that. So I know I know that in the past we've uh, we've had um, things that we've done wrong, and we've gotten our notices and uh, and and tried to make things right. But it's sometimes it's better just to do things right right out of the gate. So Mark, I'm going to let you go ahead and. Uh, take it from here and I really appreciate you being on here and I'll uh, we're going to go through and cover a, a wide range of topics and uh, Mark I'm just going to let you take it. Thank you Val. I'm very excited to be here as well um, and I hope this is a helpful uh, presentation to everybody. In the in oh, area of internet marketing um, that area covers a number of areas of law and I'm going to touch on each of them today. These areas are trademark law, copyrights, right of publicity, can spam, which is the federal law that governs email, privacy laws, the Communications Decency Act, and false advertising. Now let's just jump right into this, into trademarks. A trademark is a word or symbol used to identify the source of goods and services. You know, the most famous trademarks in the world are Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Google, or Apple. You hear those marks, you see those marks, you know who the producer or the provider of the goods and services bearing that mark is. Trademarks also cover logos, the Apple logo, the, the Nike swoosh, McDonald's golden arches. Again, you just see that, that Apple symbol, you know who is the distributor of that product bearing that symbol. And the same thing with the Nike swoosh. You see that on a, on a shoe, on a shirt, on a wristband, you know where that came from. And, and that is what a trademark is, the symbol that identifies the source of goods and services. Now, frequently with businesses, they, see, they, they start using a trademark and they get a cease and desist letter. And the, the person who sent the letter doesn't have a registration but still says, knock it off. And the question is, how can they do that to me? They don't have a registration. Well, with trademarks, registration is not required. Under tra trademark law in the United States, trademark rights are acquired by use. And it's not just using it one or two times, it's extensive use in connection with particular goods and good and service. And it's usually required to acquire trademark rights. You need use, and that's both in terms of advertising and sales. Um, and what's important in the United States, when you have when unregistered marks, which are called common law marks, these rights are only where the, where the use occurs. So if a, co if a company is using a trademark in Oklahoma and really does no business outside of Oklahoma, their trademark rights are limited to uh, Oklahoma. And, and this applies to the Internet as well. Um, if a company is based in, a, in, a, in, a local, in one region 
And yes, it has a website and does web business, but all its business is coming from that region. Its, re its rights do not extend beyond that region. Yes, the whole world gets to see their, their website on the internet, but it's still where is the business coming from, who is using the services, where is the business directed to. And when do trademark rights exist? When secondary meaning uh, is, is established. And that becomes as a result of use in advertising and, and sales when the, pub, the relevant consuming public associates that trademark with the source of the goods and services. Now, yes, you can have rights without registration, but it's always best to get a registration. And that's because registration in the United, federal registration in the United States gives a presumption of secondary meaning. With a common law trademark, if there's ever a dispute, the first thing that has to happen is the trademark owner has to prove secondary meaning. When you have a trademark registration, you don't need to do that. It's presumed. And even better with the federal mark, the, pre, the secondary meaning is presumed throughout the, United, the entire United States, not where, just where the mark is being used. And even better with the federal registration, the entire country is deemed to have notice of that trademark. So if you have a trade, if you're a new business, you have a new product, or even if you have, or you're an existing business with existing products, if you don't have regist trademark registrations, it's something you should really consider doing. Uh, because it gives you rights and it rights to protect your mark and prevent others from infringing upon those rights. Now, before you, you start using a trademark, it's always a good idea to make sure that no one else is using the mark. The worst thing that can happen is you go start a new business, you launch a new product, you uh, begin, begin a new program, you put a lot of effort and time and money behind it, and three weeks later you get a cease and desist letter saying you're trampling on my trademark rights, whether it's a common law trademark or a registered trademark. And what do you do in that situation? Um, the other side is sending you that letter may be right, and you may have a problem. You may have to terminate your program. You may change the name of your business three weeks into the name of your business. You may have to pull your product from the market three weeks into, launch, into launching the product. So in order to avoid that scenario, it's highly recommended that before you ever use it, any trademark, you conduct, conduct some kind of clearance. Uh, and how do you do that? The first way is you go to the United States Patent and Trademark Office's website at USPTO.gov and look for and do it search of the trademark office's trademark database and see if there's any marks or similar marks uh, that, are, that, are, that are registered or applied for that cover the mark that you want to use. It's also very helpful to do search internet searches for that mark to cover common law searches. Um, however, those searches, while helpful, are not entirely complete. Because of the search parameters on the trademark office's database, the use of wild cards is limited. So similar yet different marks that may still be problematic may not come up in your search. And if you're, wanna, if you're launching a Bet the Farm product, you, you're convinced the name of your business, you will not change it, it's always best to ha have something called a full search done. And what that is, is yeah, you need to retain an attorney for this. Is they, the attorneys have to deal with vendors who have these services that scour the internet, scour the trademark office database in a way that an individual, whether an attorney or just a, common, a consumer, cannot do. They have a much broader search, para search parameters and really pick up any potential mark that could um, cause a problem. And if you, it's, it's, it, you don't want to have to be, be put in a situation that you may have to change your name of your business or product. It's always best to do the full search and have a, an attorney do it. Yes, it costs money. But it's well worth it. Essentially, it's a good policy. Because if a mark comes back from a full search and is clear, the odds are of getting a cease and desist letter, the odds of getting sued for infringement are very low. Now, going forward it, it, on internet law, but now that we have an understanding of trademarks, a key issue that's going to come up again and again is the issue of nominative, nominative fair use. And what is that? Nominative fair use is a legal concept that holds you are allowed to use somebody else's trademark to identify that entity's goods or services when there's no other readily identifiable way of doing so. So for instance, take the iPad. If you want to make a reference to the iPad, even though you're not selling the iPad or not reviewing the iPad, you can refer to the iPad. You don't have to say, 
the tablet computer distributed by a company named after a tree fruit that is in season in the fall. You can say the Apple iPad. However, there are all kinds of limits on nominative fair use. The first of all is you can't call undue attention to the mark. That is, let's say you have in the text of your website, you're doing it in a 15 point font. You can't have iPad in 30 point font and bold. You, you can't call it undue attention to it. Also with nominative fair use, you can use the word mark. You can't use the logo mark. So you can say iPad, but you can't use the Apple design next to it or near it. Also, you have to use you, when you're using someone else's trademark for nominative fair use purposes, you can only use it in a way that doesn't cause confusion, that people may think that your use is somehow affiliated with Apple, or you're licensed by Apple, or you are an authorized retailer of Apple when you're not. Okay. So keep in mind this concept of, of nominative fair use. This is going to come up again and again in the, in the area of Internet law. Trademarks also come up in domain names. And I often get questions, can I use someone else's trademark in a domain name? And the answer is, it all depends. In order to do so, you need to have a legitimate reason to use the trademark. For example, you, you have a business that sells used Ford car, cars. There is, so long as you really have that business, the law permits you you have a domain name like we sell use Fords.com. Um, Ford, you know, it, it, it may be a separate issue if you have a relationship with Ford and Ford may have contractual uh, terms that say you cannot do that. But putting that aside, under the law, if you have a legitimate reason to use a trademark, you can use it in your domain name. Now, sometimes I have clients who don't have legitimate reasons to be using a trademark and they just want to cause confusion or draw traffic over to their website and they say you know, we FordUsedCars.com while they're selling Chevy used car, cars. And to try to get away with this, they do private registration. But private registration of a do domain name is not a shield. It's not going to protect the registrant if the trademark owner wants to do something uh, about the use of the trademark. And that's because all the private registration services have an exemption in their terms and condition that say if the private registration is being used for illegal purposes, including trademark infringement, they have a right to disclose the registrant's contact name and contact information. So private registration, well, might, well there are legitimate reasons for it, uh, cannot be used to hide behind when you want to do something improper. Now, I always get questions about your business, the, the, the sucks.com websites, whether you want to, people want to create one to criticize another business, or they see, their own, they see someone else doing it to criticize their business. And the question is, can somebody, do, can somebody register those domain names? The answer is, it all depends. If the domain name is being registered for really to, to have a gripe site about a specific business, that is entirely, perfect, per, entirely proper. Um, for example, if I want to do FordCarsSuck.com and my site is really about why I think Ford cars suck, Ford is not, can do nothing about it. There is a lot of case law that says that is protected by the First Amendment. However, if you're just doing that and you're really a Chevy dealer, then it's different because that's not a real gripe site. That's the way. That's a way of causing confusion. Or if you do, if you are legitimately criticizing the product covered by the domain name, but you allow competitors of that product to advertise on your website, it now takes that website and the domain name out of the exemption. So then you have a, a uh, problem. Now, this is the law, but well, let's talk about the real world. And, and the, the, this mostly happens in the situation, not the, the sucks.com websites, or domain names rather, but when you're using a trademark in a domain that we sell iPads.com. I, Apple may send you a cease and desist letter. Now, is your use of that domain name entirely proper? If you're selling iPads, yes, yes it is. It is legal. However, there's something called IP bullying, intellectual property bullying. And a large company, such as Apple, can, has the ability to, to unleash a team of lawyers on a small business just because it wants to have them stop using the domain name. 
Apple's attorneys know they're probably wrong. However, the business doesn't have the resources to fight back and usually gives in. So there is a tension here um, between what is legal and what really goes on. And unfortunately, with the case of IP bullying, um, until there's some laws passed that prevent it, um, there's really not much you can do except really if you want to fight back and spend the money, you can do it. Um, sometimes it's worth a letter fighting back, it's just a letter, not a lawsuit, that says, you're wrong, here's the law, leave me alone. And sometimes those letters work, and sometimes they don't. Hey, Mark, can I jump in here real quick? Sure. Um, I, I just wanted to share with, uh, with the listeners here that we've been the victim of IP bullying. I tell you, we uh, we've uh, uh, in, in, seriously, you know, we've uh, I know that uh, my partner and I we've had a couple um, domain names uh, like for Caterpillar Engines, um, uh, Golden Tee Golf, like you see in you know a lot of uh, bars and and uh, sports bars and things like that, uh, video games. Uh, we had those. That was a couple I can think of off the top of my head where we had uh, received cease and desist letters. Um, the, the Caterpillar one, which was weird because we, it was uh, Caterpillar engines, uh, we sold Caterpillar engines. Um, they were diesel engines, and you know, a better way to to define what it what the product was instead of by the the size of the engine, the displacement, and you know things like that. People search for Caterpillar, so the Caterpillar engines. So that's what we our domain was. And you know when we sold these engines, though, that was. I mean, we really were selling those engines. The problem was, just like you said, not having the resources to, or, or so I guess the willingness to either to fight back and not knowing was the biggest thing. We get this, um, you know, harshly worded cease and desist letter that's telling us to take it down or else. Well, we don't want to find out what the or else is because we have a lot of other, a lot of other businesses running that we don't want affected. So. We just submit, take it down, and we're done with it. But so to know that, that you do have the right to stand up, if that is in fact what you're doing and not really infringing, uh, you are selling that product. Then that's that's great to know. And in those situations, um, it's often it's not a bad idea before you even get it, the recipient of the letter before they even get a lawyer involved. If they're doing nothing wrong, like the situation you described, you're selling Caterpillar engines, and that's your domain name, it's not, pick up the phone, call the attorney who sent the letter and say, here's the deal. I really am selling legitimate Caterpillar engines. Why can't I do this? My understanding of the law is I'm doing nothing wrong, nominative fair use. And let them come back and tell you why. And sometimes they, they send these, these um, cease and desist letters without even going to the websites. And if you can demonstrate to them that you're, you're a legitimate business selling legitimate Caterpillar engines, that might help. That might make it go away. Um, so it's, oh, you know, then it, pick up the phone, make the call. If they say, too bad, stop anyway, then you have to make your decision. But it costs nothing for you, without an attorney involved, just to pick up this phone and say, what's going on here? Um, of course, the other situation is when you have no right to be using that trademark in your do domain name, Stopping is probably a good idea. Yeah. Now, does now let me ask you this: Does does having any kind of a disclosure on there, uh, you know, identifying that you're not using, you know, Caterpillar is the registered trademark of Caterpillar and is used only for reference on this site um, and is not associated, nor is a license, um, no, nor is it a licensed representative of Caterpillar. Um, this website is not not authorized by a caterpillar. I mean, any kind of disclosure like that, is that helpful? Or does it, it make any difference at all? It can't hurt. If done correctly, you know, in, in, uh, for disclaimers, it always needs to be in clear language uh, and be prominent. Uh, too often you see a disclaimer at the very, very bottom of a web page in, in a lighter font, small light font that no, it, even if you wanted to read, you can't read because it's just so hard to read. Um, if it's prominent, it can't hurt, um, but again, it is, and I get that, that yes, yeah, so if you deal with, um, you, you respond to the cease and desist letter, you can point out we have a disclaimer, or ask, do you want us to put a disclaimer on? Um, but most of these cyber bullies could care less about the disclaimer. 
Um, if you have a legitimate reason to, use, reason to be using the trademark in your domain name, if there was ever a lawsuit, yes, the disclaimer helps. You know, it, it never hurts, um, but I think in, in the case of IP bullying, it doesn't matter. They just want it down. Fair enough. Okay. Now, moving on to trademarks and paid keywords. And again, here's where nominative fair use comes in again. And again, that was also with the domain names. When can you buy someone else's trademark as a keyword? You're selling that trademark product or service. Your website is reviewing that trademark product or service. You're making a legitimate comparison to the trademark product or service to a product or service that's being sold on your website. Now, wait. Yes, you can do that. However, and then going back to number one, the selling a trademark product or service, often if you're an authorized retailer or distributor, uh, trademark owners will put place restrictions on the ability of distributors and retailers to um, bid on, on their own trademarks. Uh, trademark owners don't want to have to pay more for their own keywords because uh, their, their retailers are, are bidding on them. So putting aside the law, there's also contractual terms that you may be bound by. Um, but again, if you have a legitimate reason to be using the trademark, you can buy that trademark as a paid keyword. It, you know, the same re same law, the same reason that applies to domain names applies to keywords. On the other hand, you're selling a competitive product to the trademark product. You make no, there's no legitimate comparisons. There's no reference to that trademark on your website, the competitor's tra trademark. Then you should not be buying that keyword. You really you need to have a legitimate reason. And when I've represented clients who have competitors uh, bidding on their own trademarks, uh, bidding on my clients' trademarks, the first thing I do is go to the competitor's website that's linked to the, pay, the sponsored ad and see if my client's trademark is, even appears on the website. And if it doesn't, right away there, there are alarm bells go off as to what is the, the proper reasoning, proper purpose for using that, for buying that trademark uh, as a keyword. Similarly, trademarks and search engine optimization. Again, goes back to nominal fair use. And why are you using the trademark on your website? If it's for legitimate purposes, that's fine. Uh, again, you're selling the product, you're reviewing the product, you're making reference to the trademark, you're making reference to that product, um, you're doing a re legitimate comparison. That's all fine. Uh, but again, you, know, no, you cannot call, bring undue attention to the mark. So I know keyword stuffing, it, it, the Google alg algorithms don't pick up at, on it as much anymore. But still, you can't overuse the website, I mean, the trademark on your website in order to get a better organic listing. Um, you can't use it as much in meta, you, know, you can't use it in meta tags in order to get a, a better organic lit, uh, listing. Again, Google algorithms don't care as much about meta tags anymore, but still, if someone else's trademark is going to appear in your meta tag, you have to have a legitimate reason for it to be there. Now let's move on to copyrights. A copyright is something that protects an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. What does that mean? Movie, text, video, songs, photographs, drawings, software, includes works of art such as painting, sculpture, uh, ceramics, uh, any, any type of expression that is fixed in something um, is protectable by copyright. However, copyrights do not protect facts, ideas, systems, or methods of operation. So the fact that I am speaking right now and doing this presentation is not protected by copyright law. So anybody can write an article saying or publish something that says Rosenberg spoke during this presentation today. The ideas that I'm expressing today, uh, the ideas of copyright law being important in internet marketing uh, is not protectable. The systems that are being used uh, to, so I can, we can broadcast this uh, and record um, this presentation is not copyrightable. The software might be, but the actual mechanics of it are not. And similarly, the method of how this is working is not copyrightable. However, the systems themselves and the methods of operations may be covered by patents. This is a separate issue. Now, when does a copyright come into being? A 
comes into existence the moment the copyrightable work is fixed on a tangible medium, medium, which means whether it's written down on a piece of paper, it's photographed, uh, it's saved on your heart on a hard drive, it's uh, saved on a flash drive. As soon as it's fixed into something, on something, or in something, it is now a copyrightable work. Now, I often get the question, well, do I need to register my, co my website, my photograph, um, the text on my website, the, the look and feel of my website? And the answer is, you don't have to. Registration is not required in order to get a copyright. However, in the United States, and this is only United States law, uh, in the United States, in order to get into court to bring a copyright infringement lawsuit, in case your cop copyright is being infringed, you need to have a copyright registration. So if you have a website that has original content on it, or you think has an original look to it, or um, has original concepts on it, or original way of displaying something, it's always best to get a regist copyright registration once you get a final version of your website. Copyright registrations are very inexpensive. You don't need a lawyer to do them, and the, the filing fee is approximately $40. Um, Copyright.gov is where you go to file a copyright registration. And why is this important? Well, first of all, as I said before, to get into the federal court, or get into any court for a copyright lawsuit, registration is required. But it's also important, um, let's say you have to go sue somebody for copyright infringement. If you file, a file an application for a copyright registration soon after you publish your work, whether it's um, a photograph or, or your website, if there is ever an infringement, prompt registration gets you statutory damages. That means if there's ever a dispute, you don't have to prove your damages. There's, by law, there's certain dollar values of, stat, of damages that you're entitled to in the case of infringement, and you promptly file for your copyright file for your copyright registration. Also, even if you don't file a lawsuit, if you're sending somebody a cease and desist letter, let's say somebody copies your website, which you know I represent clients that have had their website just cut, copied and pasted wholesale, and the only thing that have changed is the name is the name of the uh, website owner. Um, sending a cease and desist letter saying this is a registered copyright. If we get into a dispute, we're entitled to statutory damages. It's helpful in resolving that because the recipient of that letter or, or their attorney knows that proving copyright damages can be expensive and difficult. But when there's statutory damages out there, there's a lot less burden of proof on the copyright owner and puts the defendant or the infringer at a disadvantage. Now, I often get questions from clients who are on the wrong end of the cease and desist letters. They, they've copied something from a website, uh, whether it's the photograph, it's, it's a lot of text, or it's the photograph and the text. They say, well, it's, uh, there's no copyright notice on it. Um, that, shouldn't I be able to, to copy that? No. You don't, copyright notice is not required on anything. However, it's always a good idea to, if you own copyrighted material, it's always a good idea because it puts the world on notice that somebody is claiming a copyright in what the notice is appearing next to. So if you have an original website, somewhere on that website you should have copyright or the C in the circle and the year and the business's name. Always a good idea. Now back to when someone is on the wrong end of the cease and desist letter. I, they say to me, well, there is no copyright notice. Doesn't matter. It's on the internet. That means I have a right to copy it. No, there's this misconception out there that, that things that are posted on the internet are free for the taking. No. Intellectual property laws that apply, to the, that apply in the brick and mortar world apply just as equally on the internet. They say that it was, so if something's offered, you see a, a website that you can go to for free, you don't have to pay to enter, doesn't matter. You cannot copy it. You go to Google Images, you see an image that's there for free, no, you cannot copy it. It's, there is a copyright somewhere. YouTube, same thing. If you want to put a, a, a YouTube video on your website and cut and paste from YouTube, you run the risk of copyright infringement. On the other hand, if you want to do a, a link to a YouTube video, that's fine. Um, then, what I see a lot on websites is background music. 
and this typically is on smaller websites, often restaurants for some reason, that as soon as you enter the website, uh, background music plays. And it's usually popular songs. I can almost guarantee you that none of these websites have gotten the permission of the copyright owners. And in the field of music, uh, copyrights for, for recorded songs are administered by two entities. Called, one is ASCAP, the other is BMI. And when they find an unauthorized use of the song that they're, they're administering, they go full bore. You will get a cease and desist letter with a demand for money. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no, there's no negotiation. ASCAP and BMI want payment. They don't care how small your website is, how few people used it. If it's being used on your website, they're going to want money. So if you're going to be using background music on your website, you've got to get permission to do that. Similarly, here's why it's a bad idea to have copy to copy someone else's works and place them on your website without without authorization. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act provides for protection for the host that's the, the, the host that the host the, the server the hosting companies that host the service for the websites. It, there's something called a takedown notice under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that if a hosting company receives, receives a properly sent um, takedown notice that provi provides all the, the, let me take a step back. For a, a Digital Millennium Copyright Act notice, the, the statutes require that the notice contain uh, several delineated items. So if the hosting company receives a proper notice, they will take down the accused website, the accused of containing the copyrighted material, unauthorized copyrighted material, immediately. They don't ask questions uh, of the website owner. They just take it down. And usually it stays down for a matter of days. And, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yes, you can send back information saying why you're not copying, why you're doing everything right. But there, in the meantime, and, and most of these hosting companies, it's just we take down for five days, ten days. In the meet, during that period, you need to send information and shoot proving why, why you have the right to do this. Your website is down. Your business is being damaged. So that, that's why you shouldn't copy. Forget, putting aside that you can get sued, the Digital Millennium Copyright Takedown Procedure can cause such disruption to your business that it's just not worth the effort. Get permission to, to copy something if you want to copy something or create your own original works. But that's why you should not copy. You know, the, being, the, the takedown system can do such damage to your business, it's just not worth it. Also, with photographs, um, somebody, you go to a website, you like the photograph, you cut and paste it, copy and paste it, put it on your photograph. You're thinking, well, again, it's on the internet, I can take it. No, photographs are copyrightable. Now, often you'll see a website's using a stock photograph. The question is, where you know, there's there there, there some stock photographs that are available for free, and that might be the case on the website, but you don't know. A lot of stock photographs come from agencies that own millions of stock photographs, and you a website can go to that agency and pay a fee and use the photograph. So the website that you may be copying from they are paying the license fee to the agency. If you copy that photograph and put it on your website, and the agency that owns the rights and the, the archive agency that owns the rights in that photograph comes after, sees it, they're going to send you a similar letter that the ASCAP and BMI sends for music saying, take it down, pay us money. And again, these agencies, these archive of photograph stock archive agencies, they don't, there's no negotiation with them. It's pay them. It's also often a lot of money, whether you like it or not, or you will get sued. No ifs, ands, or buts. So in the world of copyright, infringement, if, it, you know, if you're doing it, can really hurt you. Yes, you can cut corners uh, and avoid creating original work. Yes, you can cut corners uh, in building a website. But if you get found out, the downside is often more than you would have spent to, create some, to develop something original in the first place. That now, right of publicity. Right Do you have a question? So that is some helpful information right there. Because I know that um, a lot of times new internet marketers, especially, and, and 
you know, we've we've all been guilty of it. It's it's quick, it's easy to just go grab and create and not knowing, you know, the, the not understanding the consequences of that. That's um, that's pretty powerful to, to know that, uh, that that it could cost you more than what it would have cost you to begin with just to build it. Correct. All right. And you know you don't want to have to all of a sudden revise your entire website uh, after it's been pulled down, and you have a very you know you have a short amount of time to do it um, because it, it's going to stay down until you fix it. And you know developing a website in five days is not easy, a decent website because often you're going to have, you're going to have to start from scratch. I have a client that is very prominent in the internet in his space. It moved an area of business that was traditionally done by in-person meetings and on telephone to the internet. And its websites are just wholesale copied. And this client is very aggressive. And with the DMCA takedowns and just going into court and suing. And first of all, it has, it has a policy. If we have to sue you, you're paying our legal fees. That gets really expensive if you are on the wrong side of that. And it's, I can almost guarantee it would have been far less expensive for these companies that copied my client to create their own websites than get sued. And so wow. that, 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 before you copy, it, my advice is think about it. Think about the downside. Yes, it's cheaper in the short term. But if you're found out, it can be much, much more expensive in the long term, in including having your website taken down for a period of time where you're doing no internet business. So th that's why copyrights are so important in the internet. Now let's move on to right of publicity. The right of publicity is the right to control the use of one's name, likeness, and image for commercial purposes. So if somebody, for marketing purposes, is using, and this typically comes up with photographs, is using a photograph that has somebody's face in it, or some other way of recognizing it. For an athlete, it can be their back with their uniform number and name on it. You must have that person's permission, and it has to be written permission to use it. Now, the right to control, the right of publicity, this right to control the use of your name and likeness, does not apply to news reporting and commentary. But for marketing purposes, you must, you must, you must, and I cannot emphasize this enough, get the permission of the person whose name or likeness is appearing on your website. And this, this also includes correspondence. Let's say a business, somebody writes to a business saying, you, I am so happy with your product. I, it met my expectations. It exceeded the expectations. The price was so low. The service was great. Sign your customer. Yes, you can post that, e that letter or email on your website. However, if the customer's name is on that letter or email, all of a sudden you have a right of publicity issue. So if you're going to do that, you've got to get that customer's name uh, to be posted. Now, sometimes customers will say, fine, use my name. Others say, no, take it off. But you have to ask and you have to get it in writing. And, and again, I can't emphasize again, if you, if you get, when you get a release, it must be in writing. That, and that's because there's two reasons. One, an oral release, many states do not recognize the legitimacy of oral releases. If somebody says yes to you on the phone or in person, that it's not legally effective. And in some states, um, even a video release is not enough. So before you vid your video a testimony, a testimonial, of a product, um, you say, you know, please state your name and say that I have permission to use this video for commercial purposes. People do that. However, there, there are several states that do not recognize the legal effect of that videotaped oral release. So the release needs to be in writing. Wow, that's powerful because I know that's something that uh, a lot of people in the information marketing industry use. Is a video release. There are several states, I believe New York is one of them, that does not recognize them. And for most, te when you're doing the, the information marketing, it's a very short document that, you're that you, you can find online in some cases or have an attorney draft for very little money. 
um, that is well worth it. And, and I, I'm not trying to drum up business, but if you have it, if you get an attorney to do it, you know it's, you're going to get the right release for what you're doing. Um, you, it's not, sometimes when you copy a release from the internet, it's slightly different from what you're doing, and may not cover you. So it's essentially a useless, useless release, and then you just essentially copy, accomplish nothing. So if you're going to get a release, make sure it's the right one and, and gives you the rights that you need. Now let's move on to video marketing, which is really the crossroads of copyright and publicity law. Where do, for video marketing, where do copyrights come in? Copyrights come in in the video itself, in the script for the video, um, in, what, in the, any music that, it, that, it, that, it, that comes into the video, or that is played on the video. It comes into the creation of the video. And then where does the right of publicity, and then the right of publicity law is Anybody who, is, who appears or speaks in the video uh, has the right of publicity. So what do you do with video marketing? For the copyright, you get a license and get a release. For the copyright, you get either a license to use the music or you get what's called a work for hire agreement for everybody that's involved in the uh, video, in the production of it. That means the, the director, the producer, the camera person, the lighting person, um, they all have to sign something called a work for hire agreement that says any copyrights or other rights that are created in this video, I the cameraman, I the director, I the actor, hereby grant to the, uh, what the, uh, the person who's creating, who wants this video created. And then for the people appearing in the video, you get a release. And I, and I mean, a, and this goes back to right of publicity, I mean a release from everybody, whether it's your employee, your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your next door neighbor, everybody. Because why? Yes, you say it's my employee, it's my husband, it's my boyfriend. The people change their minds. They see the release that gets put up on the, on the website, they, say, uh, they see the video that gets put up on the website, and they say, I don't like it. I don't like the way I look. Take it down. Or it's your boyfriend or your girlfriend, three weeks after posting the video on your website, you break up. They don't want it anymore. And the same thing, the employee quits. If the, you don't have a written release, they have the ability, legally, to have that video taken down. And moreover, they have, not only do they have the ability to take it down, there's a potential to get damages. Because you're using their right, right of public, violating their right of publicity without permission. So, for video marketing, it is so important to get licenses, the, right of, the work for hire agreements, for everybody and everything involved in that video. And for people, you've got to get those written releases for anyone who appears in that video. Can spam. Can spam is the federal law that governs the, the use of commercial emails. And there's a just High level, here is what CanSpam requires. That the sender of the email can't use false or misleading header information. The, per the recipient of the email needs to know, readily tell, where that email and from who that email came from. You can't use deceptive subject lines in the email. The email cannot say, you have won a million dollars. Well, then when you read the text of the email, no, you haven't won a million dollars. If you buy this product, you put into a sweepstakes, you have the chance to win a million dollars or something like that. It has to identify the email message as an advertisement. This doesn't, Cansom doesn't say where. It doesn't say how, but it must. So you can, in the subject line, you can say, you know, in capital letters, ADV, the advertisement, you can say, advertisement at the top of the email, but somewhere in the email, it needs to make clear this is an advertisement. And don't assume that the reader is going to figure out this is an, adver this is an advertisement. The law doesn't say that. Um, it needs to be somewhere, it has to physically say, say in writing, advertisement, or some of the, something else that indicates this is an advertisement. You need to tell the re recipients where you're physically located or how they can send mail to you. So either you, 
somewhere in that commercial email message, you need to include your postal address, whether it's the physical address where your, your building is located, or P.O. box. But there needs to be some way to communicate with you by, by snail mail. You need to tell recipients of that email message how to opt out from receiving future emails from you, how to unsubscribe. Uh, whether it's a link, whether it, that you just they simply click on, whether they send an email to, to somewhere, or send or, or a postal address. Now, importantly, with the unsubscribe, the opt outs. Once you receive an opt out request, you must must take that person off your email list promptly. I believe it's ten, you have ten days to do it. And if you don't, you're in violation of not only the Can Spam Act, but a lot of state law uh, requirements regarding Can Spam. And there are people out there um, that sign up for emails and then quickly unsubscribe just so that they can fall, just so they can create causes of action to sue the emailers to get statutory damages for having the unsubscribes not followed. And, and there's this attorney out in California who makes a career of this. He himself signs up for, gets on the email list, unsubscribes, and then looks for the opportunity for the unsubscribe request not being uh, complied with. And he's made a ton of money doing this. Importantly, you need to monitor what others are doing on your behalf. When um, a lot of email, a lot of companies don't do the email marketing themselves. They retain other, e they retain email marketing services. Um, under the law, the company that retains the email marketing service can be just as liable for what goes on for the violation of can spam as the market email mark email service it itself. So whenever you are um, getting involved with an, an email marketing service, make sure that that agreement, first of all, that it's a reputable, let's start, that it's a reputable entity, uh, that it has, um, that it's been around for a while, that it has assets, it's not a fly-by-night operation, and that your agreement with them has an indemnification provision, that they, if that, if the market email marketing service violates the law and you get sued, that the email marketing company will indemnify you for whatever damages arise out of the email marketing company's uh, improper acts. Now, in addition to can spam, a lot of states have state law uh, versions of can spam. And these laws primarily go to the content of the messages themselves and, and fraudulent conduct and prohibit uh, misleading, e misleading messages and, mislead and fraudulent emails. Um, Interestingly, the state laws have higher statutory damages than can spam. So you can buy, violate both can spam and a state law uh, email statute and be more liable under the state law than under the federal law. Um, so you got you, email, when done wrong, is very expensive. Now, just because there are all these restrictions on email marketing doesn't mean you can't do it and doesn't mean you have to always have permission to send an email. In fact, can spam doesn't say you have to have permission. It just it has these requirements we just mentioned um, on, on what you must do in your message. Also, can spam specifically allows some transactional and relationship emails. And, and what are transactional and relationship emails? A transactional email is somebody purchases a product on your website. You're allowed to send a confirmation. You're allowed to send a note, an email saying your product has shipped. You're allowed to send an email saying you know, you've received your product. Did you like it? Do you have any? Did you? How was your customer relation? How was your whole customer experience with us? However, when you send those transactional messages, can spam still applies. So you still have to have the opt outs and everything else uh, required by can spam. Same thing with relationship emails. You have, a, you have a customer, you're allowed to send that customer follow-up email saying, we're having a sale, we're, we're offering a new product. Again, you can do that. But again, can spam applies. So if that customer opts out, you must um, follow that opt-out. You're allowed to rent email lists. Renting email lists is always a risky endeavor because you're only as good as what that list is only as good as what the, the renter represents to you. And what do I mean by that? When's, 
So you collect email addresses when you are a website collects email addresses in the course of running its business um, you know, by selling by, sell, by by selling products or people sending in lists. If the, the website's privacy policy permit says we share our email lists with other companies, um, then you can then you are, that's how websites are able to rent lists or purchase lists from other people because websites can transfer emails. However, when a website does transfer does share its email addresses with other people, that website first of all really needs to have the consume the customers who are providing the email address opt in. Then they can those customers cannot complain you had no right to do this. Even if the, the privacy policy says we share email addresses, nobody reads privacy policies. But when you have somebody check off a box to say I agree to the privacy policy, I or I, I have read and understand and agree to the privacy policies, later on if there's an issue, no one they can they, they are they cannot complain because they agreed to it. So when you get an email list, here's what you want when you're renting a list and purchasing a list. You want, of course, the email address. You want the date the person opted in to having their email address shared. You want the website, the, 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 the website, specific website where that person opted in to do it and, where, and the IP address of the computer from which that person opted in. If you have all that information, the renter is giving you all that information, the odds are it's a legitimate list. And that's not and I'm, and when you rent when, for that information. That's not asking a lot. That that is the typical information that comes with a good email list. If a entity that's renting lists or selling lists is not giving you all that information, alarm bells should go off because they're not engaged in the standard practice. So if someone says, "I'll give you a list, but I don't have the IP address, I don't have the website, or I don't have the the date," something is wrong, and proceed with caution. Because they might not have the right to be, to, to be uh, distributing that list. And again, for your own good, if you're going to be uh, sharing email addresses with others, it's very important to have your privacy policy have an opt-in. And I, I always like to see people not have the, blo the box checked off already, but make the user click on, check off the box you know, by, its, by him or herself. That way, it's an affirmative act of opting into the privacy policy. And no one can say, I don't agree. I never saw it. Uh, odds are they're going to check off without reading it. But that's then their problem, not yours. Now this, again, sharing of email addresses brings up the issue of privacy. And what, what, is, what, are, the privacy, what are the privacy issues on the internet? It's really any personally identifiable personally. Let me try that again. Personally identifiable information. And what is personally identifiable information? It's a name, it's contact information, uh, it's the social security number, credit card information. If you have that information, you have to have a privacy policy saying exactly what you're going to do with it. And if you're going to retain it, your privacy policy really needs to say exactly, it's particularly, let me take a step back. Um, often companies they have a they get the information they get the credit card it's a one shot deal they save nothing and that's the easiest way of doing it because there can't be any data breaches they can't there's no issue of sharing with third parties because there's nothing to share but that information is valuable particularly the contact information so a lot of entities of course want to keep at least the contact information not the credit card information and, and then. That's one step. So your privacy policy is to say, we retain your contact information. And here's what we're going to do with it. If you're going to share that contact information, because there's money to be made by sharing the contact information, your privacy policy needs to say that as well. And again, if you're sharing, I highly, highly advise that the opt-in, that the privacy policy be an opt-in like I described before, that someone needs to check off the box uh, and say, I agree that you, to the privacy policy. I understand the privacy policy. Again. Most of the time, no one's going to read the privacy policy, but they're going to check off the box anyway. But again, you're in a much better place if somebody checks it off, because then they can't say, I didn't know. Because the law says if you, if you sign, sign something without reading it,
That's your fault. It's not the entity that gave you the document that you signed or agreed to. And when you have a privacy policy, you got to follow it. Um, a website can have the best privacy policy in the world and have the best opt-in procedures, and then they ignore, ignore their own privacy policy. And if there's ever an issue that comes up that a website has their privacy policy and they're not even complying with their own privacy policy, you, you know where that, that a lawsuit's going to end up like that. The website is going to certainly be on the wrong side of that lawsuit and it's going to be paying money. So if you ha when you have a privacy policy, you've got to follow it. And I, I don't know how many times I've dealt with clients who I've drafted the privacy policy for or another attorney had drafted the policy privacy policy for it. These are great privacy policies. And what's the problem that comes up? The client ignored its own privacy policy. And, and then you were, that client is in, in such a bad position when that happens. The Communications Decency Act. This is, this is a, another law that is specifically applicable to the Internet and designed for the Internet. What is it? It's a federal law that covers user-generated content. And user-generated content is comments, um, reviews, um, chat rooms, anything that a user places on a website. And what the Communications Decency Act protects the website owner from pretty much any state law civil claim concerning that, general, that, that user generated content. And in most of the time, these claims have to do with defamation, which is uh, libel and slander. And it includes trade libel when criticizing another business. And it, the Communications Decency Act is almost a blank, is pretty much a blanket protection for website owners for these types of state law claims based on user-generated content. However, it's not that simple. For user-generated content, the website owner cannot be involved with the generation or editing of that content. It, you cannot, it cannot edit that content in any way. It cannot pick and choose which content appears on this website and, and which does not. It cannot create a system that you fill that the user fills in the blanks to create the content. Uh, that is all. Now the, the, the website owner is deemed to be involved with the generation of the content, which takes it outside of the, the protection of the Communita Communications Decency Act and takes away the safety net that the, that the act provides. Now, then, now people are wondering. Can I control? I don't want to have my users you know, pr 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 posting reviews that have profanity, that have racist and sexual statements in it, um, that um, contain, contain defamation, that contain advertisements for another business. No, you can still prevent that. And what you do is you have your terms and conditions that if anybody is going to be posting on your website, putting any content on your website, they have to agree by your ter by the terms and conditions. And again, terms and conditions are always. Opt in, opt in, opt in. Make them check off the box to say they agree. And your terms and conditions say, if you're doing user-generated content, this is the type of content that's not permitted on our website. And typically, it's defamation, it's third-party advertising, it's sexual and racist comments, it's profanity, things like that. If that, those terms and conditions are violated, the website is permitted to, to take down those posts, those user-generated user posts. And that does not take you outside the Communications Decency Act, because there's no subjective editorial uh, decision-making going on. You have a website, you have a term and condition that's being violated, you take down the post. That's it. Now, if you're going to be doing that, you've got to be consistent. Uh, either you don't follow, you, you don't take down any of the posts, or you, you take down all the posts that, that violate these terms and conditions. But if you start getting selective, saying, well, it's a pretty good post, uh, I'm going to let it stay up, but I'm going to take down this one because, yes, it makes a sexist comment, but it's really funny. No, because now you're involved with uh, subjective decision making on the context of subjective editing. Either you take all the posts down that violate the terms and conditions, or you take none of them down. Um, and you don't, there, there's, all, there's, there's software out there that has all these that can filter out the user generated content that if it sees certain phrases or expressions it automatically deletes that content. Uh, another one is somebody you don't want the same person reposting 10 times a day uh, but usually they have an axe to grind or they're, they're doing something for an improper purpose. If the software sees that, that uh, the posts are coming from the repeatedly coming from the same IP address 
it automatically deletes that, that, those posts. But again, that's fine. But when you're making a decision, well, I, I like this one, but I don't like that one, you're editing. That can't be done. So, what, so again, opt in for the terms and conditions and be consistent. The last two subjects, privacy and the Communications Decency Act, I keep talking about terms and conditions and privacy policies. Here's, make sure, if you're an interactive website, you need to have a good set of terms and conditions and a good privacy policy. And a good one doesn't mean copying terms and conditions or privacy policy from your competitor or from a website that has a similar business than you. Than, than you. First of all, that can be copyright infringement. I know an attorney who sells form, form terms and conditions, form uh, privacy policy, and that attorney retains the copyright in them. And the attorney has strategic typos in her terms and conditions and privacy policies, so she knows whether or not it's being copied. And if she finds out that th those terms and conditions and privacy policies have been copied, she has a copyright claim and demands that that website pays money for them. Also, putting aside the copyright uh, infringement issue for copied terms and conditions and privacy policies, often when, a web, when terms and conditions and privacy po policies are copied, they don't necessarily reflect exactly what you're doing on your website, what you're doing in your business, and you may, not end, up, you may end up with a terms and conditions and privacy policy that doesn't apply to your own business, which is essentially useless. So you're in a position of violating the privacy policy because it doesn't cover what you're, exactly what you're doing, and the terms and conditions don't cover what the, the users are doing on your website because it's not for your business. So really, it's, wor it's worth the money to get an attorney to give you a good set of privacy policy, a good set of terms and conditions and a privacy policy. And it shouldn't be that expensive. If an attorney wants a lot of money for terms and conditions, go somewhere else. But um, best to get your own terms and conditions to cover your website, uh, copying someone else's is first of all maybe copyright infringement and maybe not even applicable to your own website. Now false advertising. I'm just going to touch on this area because it's really for legal purposes a world unto itself. Uh, in the internet the, the false advertising issues are primarily governed by the Federal Trade Commission and also state attorney generals. In the last five to ten years the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, has put a serious focus on internet advertising and really has cracked down on abuses going there. Now, how do you get out of avoiding false advertising claims, whether on, on the federal level or, or the state level? And the, the best advice I have for anyone doing business, whether brick and mortar, internet, or both, is be honest in your business dealings. Make your, your representation should be true. It shouldn't be misleading. There should be no hooks that nobody notices. If you're running an honest business with honest descriptions, honest advertising, honest marketing, the odds are you're going to be in compliance with the Federal Trade Commission and, and state laws regarding advertising. But beyond that, there's specifics. I'm not, and I'm really not going to cover the specifics in this presentation. It's just, it goes, it just, it, that's really a presentation unto itself. But just a few recent FTC developments, FTC, FTC regulations that people need to be aware of. And the first one is flogging. And flogging is a, a, somebody is blogging and pretending to be just a blogger when they're actually being paid to promote a product or it's actually their own product. Uh, there's FTC regs that now specifically prohibit flogging unless there, it's prominently uh, noted what they're doing, that you know, we, are the pro we are representing our own product, we are being paid to uh, blog about this product. And that, these regs actually include Let's say there's a legitimate blog, and a company says, you know, blogger, here's a free, free um, product of ours. Write about it. The fact that you're now being given a free product by the manufacturer distributor of that product, that you're now being brought under these FTC regulations regarding flogging. So you need to um, make clear that you received the product for free or that you were being paid to promote that product. There's new FTC regulations on disclaimers, uh, particularly in the weight loss category, um, and the way, you know representations that you see may not be or may be this for this individual. They may not be applied to you. There's all new FTC regs on disclaimers regarding you know 
what you see on what you see in the ad is really a one-shot deal. Um, so you really need to focus on what your disclaimers say. And then there's been a lot of FTC work um, on recurring payments, and that's when somebody gives you a credit card um, number, and they think it's a one-time. Um, and here's why why I started is people think they've given you the credit card for a one-time purchase. Turns out that they didn't read the fine print or that the print is extremely deceptive or completely missing, um, that this person didn't sign up for a one-shot deal. It signed up, the person signed up to have their credit card charged on a monthly basis or a yearly basis for a product they continue to get. And more often than not, what brought about the, this, these FTC actions is people were getting, this is primarily for the teeth whitening ads, and each month they were getting teeth whitening uh, products and getting charged for it when they only thought they were signing up one time for it. Or, or, or they thought they were signing up for um, paying for shipping and handling for a one-time sample. So for the false advertising um, uh, issues, you know, they, they particularly come into play for weight loss, insurance, and business opportunities. The FTC is really cracking down on those. So if you're in, in marketing in those areas, I highly recommend that you work with an attorney to, to review all of your advertising. Because if you get involved with a dispute with the Federal Trade Commission, it is going to cost a lot of money to resolve. Well, I'd like to also add, too, real quick while you're on the false advertising, um, that uh, income claims. Um, I know that's, uh, that's a really big issue, false income claims, uh, income claims that you don't have proof of um, when you're marketing, uh, especially an internet, um, I don't know, internet marketing extravaganza product that uh, you know, is going to make you so much money that your your great grandkids will be shut up for life. Uh, making just big, uh, I, I know that we've seen a lot of income claim issues and questions come along. Absolutely, uh, that fall, and that, that falls under the category of business opportunities. Often, um, any anything regarding income, whether whether investments or a business, um, have an attorney review your promotional material. Because if it, if it, even if you mean well, if it's done wrong, it can, it can cost so much money to resolve, both in legal fees and penalties, that it, the, having an attorney, paying an attorney a small amount to review your promotional copy will go a long way in preventing any dispute or, or a problem with the FTC or a state attorney general. Anyway, think of it, you know, yes, you can spend legal fees up front, but think of it as an insurance policy. If, if the attorney does it correctly, the odds are you're never going to hear from the FTC or the state attorney general. And if a person has a problem with it, the person it's more, more likely than not the person's mistake, not yours. And if the person makes a mistake, then people make mistakes. And if, you're, if the advertiser, the marketer is doing everything right, the person who makes a mistake has no claim. Now, the latest is... Uh, advertising on the internet is social media. Um, everybody's doing it. Um, social media, it takes all the law of internet marketing and it all applies to social media. The trademarks, the copyrights, the false advertising, all apply to marketing on social media. Even can spam. Uh, there's several recent court decisions regarding um, advertising where Somebody, in order to get something, you have to click on a. You have to like something on Facebook, and when you click on like on Facebook, assuming that people's privacy settings are set in a certain way, all of you that that person's friends get a notice that the user likes this product or likes this commercial product. These cases say these are these likes are emails and governed by can spam and have to fully comply with CAN-SPAM. And I recently represented a client who was sued by Facebook and the state of Washington for, this, for these very types of advertising. And it, it's a, it's, so all of these areas of law that I have just spent speaking about all apply to social media. And social media adds another layer of legal issues is that each social media website, Facebook, um, YouTube have their own terms and conditions. 
which apply to whatever you're doing on that website. You know, Facebook, let's say you want to have it do a sweepstakes that, are, that is promoted through Facebook. Facebook has a page of regulations, of rules, regarding Facebook's promoted through, um, sweepstakes promoted through Facebook. So not only do you have to comply with the, all the laws regarding sweepstakes, which and there are 50 different ones for each state, you need to comply with Facebook's rules regarding sweepstakes uh, if you're going to promote your uh, sweepstakes on Facebook. And finally, you try to do everything right and you get a cease and desist letter. What do you do? Well, the one thing you don't do and you cannot do is to ignore a cease and desist letter. If there's almost one way to guarantee that somebody that you're going to get sued is that you ignore a cease and desist letter. It may not come immediately, but eventually an ignored cease and desist letter, more often than not, leads to a lawsuit. So what do you do when you get a cease and desist letter? As I mentioned earlier before with the domain names, um, you may want to just call up the attorney and say, I don't understand, I'm doing everything right. And sometimes it may be a simple misunderstanding. If it's more complicated than that, you've got to get an attorney. And you, you need to figure out what to do. Sometimes it's just not worth fighting about. Uh, it's, it's a product you don't care about. It's a website you don't care about. It's a statement on a website, or a, it's just not worth it's just not worth fighting about. You just say, "All right, fine, I'll take it down." And in, if you, in that instance, you may be able to do it yourself without an attorney. You just call up, the, you let the whoever the attorney who sent the cease and desist letter say, "All right, sorry, I'm you know something. I'm taking it down. We're done." And, and usually that resolves the matter. But if it's something more complicated than that, uh, you don't want you think you're doing everything right, and the other side, the, the sender of the letter says, "No, you're not," and it's something you care about, whether it's the name of your business, the name of your product, the look of your website. Uh, you think you have a perfectly legitimate website in terms of the photographs, the text, the look and feel of it, and someone says, "No, you're copying mine." Um, you need to get a law. You will need to get a lawyer involved, and that that let the, the lawyer is going to have to help you. And the, the decision you have to make is, how hard do I want to fight? And how much am I willing to spend to fight? And, and that's a case-by-case, business-by-business um, -business decision. Sometimes you care, it's not worth fighting about, even though, you're, even though you're right, it's just not worth the money. Sometimes it's bet the farm, that I believe I'm right. I invested in this website. I invested in this name. I invested in my business based on this name. I'm not going out without a fight. And I'm going to spend it whatever it takes. So it's a case-by-case -case business. But again, with cease and desist letters, do not ignore them. And that's an overview of the law that applies to internet marketing. I hope this has been of assistance. And thank you, Val, Val uh, for the time. I really enjoyed this. Uh, Mark, it was my pleasure. And uh, I really, I was excited about this. And I know some, uh, some of my partners were as well, that this topic is something that is something that you know, most of us, we, we know there's there's laws and all, but we, you know, but we don't know what they are or what they really are. We just kind of think we know from maybe reading a forum here and there um, or, or what we've heard from other people. But uh, really, you know, it just in this case is no different than any other case out driving your car down the road and you're breaking the speed limit. You didn't know that, you know, what the speed limit was. Ignorance of the law was no excuse. So. This really is great information because it lets you know, you know, this is this is what you need to know to protect yourself, protect your ideas, protect your properties, and not to infringe on anyone else. So I think this was a this is a really valuable call and a very valuable lesson for people here to get this kind of information so that they can apply it to their marketing and to their business. So I really appreciate your time, Mark. And I really appreciate you coming on and uh, doing this interview with us. Thank you. All right. Well, guys, we're going to have this information up. As you can see, there's information here to contact Mark Rosenberg. If you have any uh, questions about Internet law and, um, and all the different aspects that we covered today, and then some, um, please get a hold of Mark. Um, he's a wealth of information. I'm sure he'd be very happy to help you. Um, guys, thank you for your time, and we'll see you on the next expert interview.